So I was actually interested in this earlier this week. Um, so the first satellite, Sputnik 1, was launched in 1957, I think. Um, since then, there have been about 10,000 satellites launched, which tells you we've really ramped up the production in those 64 years. <laughs> um, uh, and there's, from what I understand, about 3,000 of those are, are non-functional, and about half of the remaining are inactive, which means they're just not being used, but they could still work. Hey everyone, welcome to It's a Material World. We're the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. Consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. It would really help us out. And before we get started, just wanted to mention that we have released material science merchandise for those of you who want to support us or just express your passion for MSE. You can check out more of the designs at itsmaterialworldpodcast.com forward slash shop or by clicking the link in the description. All right, let's get right into it. Our sponsor today is Johnson Matthey, a global leader in sustainable technology. Johnson Matthey's vision is for a world that's cleaner and healthier today and for future generations. Johnson Matthey's scientists use their deep understanding of materials, surface science, chemistry, and chemical engineering to design catalysts, advanced materials, and processes, tackling the world's biggest challenges, such as reaching net zero, enabling cleaner air, improving health, and using our planet's natural resources more efficiently. For over 20 years, they have been in the manufacturing and shape setting of nitinol tubes, sheets, and components for the medical device industry. So Johnson Matthey is an ideal sponsor for today's podcast. Johnson Matthey, inspiring science, enhancing life. All right, hello everybody. Today's guest is Jordan Dobson. Jordan's background is in environmental engineering, but he has since switched to more of a material science focused role at Biosat, where he's currently the lead material science engineer at Biosat. Uh, his work primarily focuses on working with engineers to make sure the pr uh, final products are viable, as well as help work on any materials selection issues. Thank you, Jordan, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Thrilled to talk to you guys and your listeners. It's a great opportunity to share, I think. Yeah, for sure. We're excited, too. And so let's start with the basics. You know, Viasat is known as a global communications company. So can you just talk us through maybe some applications that are encompassed in such a broad term? Yeah. So Viasat is a broadband communications company. So providing things like Saturday, satellite internet all over the world in all different types of applications. There's over 600,000 people uh, that currently are involved with Viasat internet systems. So uh, that would be people that have or use them for work. Um, it's used on several major airlines, including Delta and United. Uh, it's used for high-speed internet on sea vessels, uh, U.S. military and allied forces. Um, but it's important to distinguish that it's a different type of satellite connection than you might see for like direct TV or dish network. Because um, Viasat internet and just the internet in general, it's a two-way signal rather than that one-way signal. So everywhere you have a point that's receiving information also has to be able to broadcast that information all the way back to space and back to the ground. So when you make the difference between the two, how exactly does like the internet on my phone, I assume I don't get uh, straight from like Viasat uh, like uh, satellites, how, how does that two different uh, methods of communication work? Yeah, so phone internet is based on connections to cell towers. So cell towers will be connected um, via ground systems and to each other. But if you're connected to say a Viasat system, um, you, I mean, generally it wouldn't be applicable for a phone unless you had a satellite phone. Um, but for another system that's connected, it's got uh, the same thing you would have at home, like a modem and a router um, mm -hmm. that communicates with your devices and then with the Viasat equipment. And the Viasat equipment then is able to broadcast that information to a satellite in orbit. Um, the satellite sends that back down to a ground station, and the ground station is what connects it to the rest of the internet. So Viasat is a, a, an ISP in the same way that, that other companies are internet mm -hmm. service providers. So it just gives you that connection to the internet where it has to go up and down to a satellite. Well, cool. Um, I guess going back to our intro, we said that you're the lead material science engineer at Biosat. 
So could you tell us what material science and engineering looks like at a global company and what exactly you do as a lead material scientist? Yeah, absolutely. So I serve two main functions. Uh, the first is I'm a resource for design engineers. So, I mean, I mentioned we have a broad array of applications. Uh, I am available whenever they have questions um, about material concerns. So if you're concerned about the application of this product on a naval vessel or at sea or in the air or in, even in space, uh, I'm available to help answer those questions and can be a subject matter um, so that our other engineers, the electrical um, the, and the communications engineers and even the mechanical engineers don't need to know all that specific materials information and how to deal with those environments. The second primary function relates to compliance. Uh, so all across the world, our systems are deployed and they face a vast array of different compliance requirements. Uh, if you think about just the airline products, for example, um, the airlines and the FAA have requirements on things like flammability and fungus growth, which directly relates to what the material is composed of. And so I do analyses on our products to make sure they meet those compliance requirements. Cool. So I know in our previous conversation, it seemed like you developed a versatile background in a wide array of materials, but I was just wondering what class of materials do you work um, generally it's electronics, uh, based things. So, I mean, uh, wires, cables, electronic components like inductors, resistors, um, integrated circuits, uh, circuit boards. Um, generally those are the things that take the most time, but for any Viasat system, uh, I review the entirety of the product. So every material it's composed of it sees my review. We, we've talked about this before, but being a material science engineer is kind of like being a jack of all trades and mm -hmm. you don't even have a traditional materials background. So I guess, could you kind of elaborate more about how it kind of seems like you have to understand each individual part to be effective at your job? You have to be able to learn about the part quickly is what I've found is the most important. So even if you're not aware of a specific material or a specific requirement or something like that, you need to be able to see it and develop that understanding with whatever resources are available. So, uh, I mean, people out there aren't using like very cutting edge things right now. There's no metamaterials being worked into our systems, <laughs> but uh, it, so there's resources out there for whatever is going to be used and you can find that. And it's, it's about developing that understanding quickly and, and correctly. Do you have any strategies for um, not only finding that information, but really understanding it in terms of like the application you're focused on? Well, it, it can depend on the application. So like I, I mentioned, there's the flammability and the fungus, and that comes down a lot to testing. So, sometimes the material just hasn't been tested for a specific requirement or something like that. Mm -hmm. And and that, it, it just needs to be tested. That that. There's no ifs, ands, or buts around it. But um, for more interesting materials requirements um, where things are a little more flexible, uh, it just comes down to, can you understand what it's composed of? If you can get, uh, it, it's normally called a full material disclosure. If you can get a full documentation of every material and what every material is made of in your system, you're set for life. You can always go back and do any type of analysis you need. Well, I guess before we move on, just one fun question. What's the weirdest regulation you've seen while working uh, across like all these different regulations? I don't know. There, there are some really interesting specific ones. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I came across one because the person that was asking me to meet this requirement, I don't think understood it very well. Um, so we had a satellite system, um, so a, a ground system that would connect to a satellite. And uh, I was asked to make sure it meets the requirements for uh, hazardous materials in dental, um, so, so like dental surgical equipment. <laughs> I'm like, this is not applicable. <laughs> it's entirely out of scope. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it didn't contain many of those materials, but uh, I had to go back and tell them that they uh, probably needed to change their requirements. 
<laughs> had to do some biocompatibility testing or something like that. Yeah, yeah, we're not not trying to do that. <laughs> not going to be useful. <laughs> cool, cool. So since this is a broadband communications company that reaches all parts of the world, we were just wondering how does engineering and specifically like material science and engineering differ across different nations? How does this affect innovation and decision making? So uh, in thinking about that, you you might be led to think, oh, climate differences, uh, materials will behave very differently in a desert versus, uh, say, in like a forest or in a suburb. But generally, things aren't that different. Uh, I mean, air, land, sea, very different, and space, very, very different. But um, generally, the differences worldwide are about what the individual countries or customers are doing. So it's very um, regulation focused, not, for example, climate focused. Mm -hmm. Um, And those material science concerns are generally customer driven. So either what does that customer want or where is that customer located and what requirements do they have to meet because of that? Like if you're shipping something to the European Union, so as one of the countries in the European Union, um, there are a lot of, say, hazardous material requirements and energy efficiency requirements you have to meet, but those same requirements don't exist in places like the United States. And so I guess when we talk about the broader globe, you're talking about a lot of communication systems that aren't located in one specific place. A lot like if you're talking about airplanes with their antennas or satellites, they're going around the globe in very different ways. Uh, I guess like when we think about regulations in that respect, uh, are there a lot of rules about like if an airplane flies over uh, like France, it has to follow all France's rules? Or I know that air in general has been a talking point about who owns what air basically. Yeah, so that is an excellent question that I don't actually have the answer to. (laughs) Specifically for airlines, they give you what the requirements are and that meets everywhere they think that plane will ever go. Um, so if, if they're saying, put this on this plane and make sure it has these requirements, that's all it's gonna need. And at that point, they become responsible for wherever that, that plane goes. Um, for things like satellites, uh, it is a bit different, but satellite um, technology is not highly regulated at all. There's not much, above the 35,000 feet that planes fly at that is is regulated. For lack of a better term, you could put anything you want up there. I mean, Elon (laughs) Musk put a a car in space for no reason. Yeah, he did. (laughs) You can do whatever you want. Um, And that's not necessarily a positive. Mm. (laughs) Um, Yeah, but an interesting concern too is these communication systems, especially the ground systems, don't develop overnight. Like if you're going to connect to a satellite, you need to have those ground systems in place uh, Mm -hmm. so that you can connect those satellites to the internet. Um, And those things are are not quick to put in place. So when you're considering these global scale systems, you have to be looking at all the different regulations those might need to meet. Like if, if we're going to make a standard system that is an antenna that connects from the ground to the satellite and back down, all across the world, it's better to have one system that can meet as many requirements as possible. So mm-hmm. you want to be really conservative with what types of materials you're using, how safe it is, and how hazardous it could be in the future. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, you mentioned the ground systems at least multiple times so far in this episode. So I was just wondering if we could briefly dive into that. You mentioned the antenna and everything like that. What are the main material requirements you're looking at from the ground system perspective? Um, So I I just want to give you a scale for the ground systems. So you might see like a a direct TV antenna on the back of someone's house. It's a flimsy flat plate, maybe a couple feet across. Mm -hmm. Um, The ground systems that connect to satellites are more what you might see in like a movie where they're sensing alien uh, signals from space. They're huge. Um, So, I mean, we have systems up to, I think, 25 meters in diameter. Um, And that's that's enormous. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And those things are able to track satellites across the sky. Um, So primarily, 
uh, the materials need to support the weight of those systems. Um, but then there are a lot of concerns because if you're putting a 25 meter diameter satellite or a satellite dish there, mm -hmm. um, you don't want to be replacing that every four or five years. So uh, those systems are all about longevity for the most mm -hmm. part. So you want to make sure the system's not going to corrode for 15, 20 years at a minimum. Uh, so it's a lot about, uh, say, if you put two dissimilar metals close together, they can corrode that way. Uh, depending on the environment, certain metals need to be coated specific ways um, to, to protect them. Uh, so it, it's a lot about how can you make these expensive systems last for as long as possible? Mm -hmm. Are you allowed to tell us just, in, I guess, in general, what metals are being used in these like ground systems and how they integrate with all the electronics that are needed? Or is that kind of steel, of steel, 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 I mean, steel, steel, <laughs> steel is used for everything. <laughs> cool. and, and I guess, uh, I know, and this kind of leads into our next one, but we're uh, one application we want to dive deeper in is basically airline antennas. But now my question is more just about antennas in general. Can you tell us about like how an, an actual antenna works? Is it is it also made out of steel? And like what exactly makes everything tick so that we can send information through these things? Yeah. So, um, it it helps if you can picture in your mind the satellite dish. So you have the dish. And then you have what's called the, the feed horn that comes out of the dish. So mm -hmm. it's the little maybe spoon-like object that comes out. Uh, so the dish is a parabolic reflector. Mm -hmm. So it can take signal from a wider space and then it reflects it all back into a single point. Mm -hmm. um, and that intensifies the signal so that you have a stronger signal to process. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what the dishes do. They, they the big dish just intensifies the signal up into a single point in that feed horn that sticks out in front of the dish where it's interpreted down in the rest of the systems. And, and so the, I guess, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. I just wanted to address because it is a two-way system. The mm -hmm. feed horn can also do the same thing in reverse. It can output signal, which is then spread out to cover a wider area. Oh, so it would like basically almost be like when you're shooting light through a prism, it like splits it out and then shoots it back up in like the wider range from the dish. Yes. Uh, so if you, if you shoot it out in a spread like that and you hit the, the parabolic reflector, it mm -hmm. shoots, it reflects back out in a straight parallel line uh, so that it, it goes straight without too much. Um, uh, I forget the word, but it, mm -hmm. diffraction without too mm -hmm. much diffraction. And then on the satellite, is it like just like a little mini dish? I, I assume you can't shoot up a 25 meter diameter <laughs> dish up there. So is it just the same system, but smaller? Uh, it's a, a similar system. Yeah, they, they use the same types of dishes. Yeah, and if, if you're interested, you can go um, look up a picture of the satellites that they're available online. And so I guess back to my original question was that, <laughs> um, one common application that I keep on seeing in airlines and like, it's like a new thing is that like uh, Wi-Fi on the plane. And so they're obviously not using uh, cell towers like our phones normally do. Uh, so what type of innovation was made there? And uh, what do we kind of think about uh, when we're trying to develop these systems? Well, it's interesting that you bring that up. Uh, and this is something that I learned just yesterday, which tells you how, how relatively new I am. Airlines did used to use mobile broadband. Mm -hmm. um, so there used to be, or and still are in some planes, antennas on the bottom of the plane that connect to mobile networks, which is why they're also terribly slow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that seems very inefficient. <laughs> yeah, but Viasat systems, uh, which are still relatively new, but in place in a lot of planes uh, and, and very well tested now, um, meet a, a challenging problem. So you have a plane at 30,000 feet in the air moving at 500 miles an hour. Now, to be able to uh, communicate with the satellite, you have to keep your dish locked straight onto that satellite. So can you imagine how hard it would be to line up a, a, a dish to constantly face as you're moving 500 miles per hour? Uh, that's the challenge that those antennas face. Um, but the 
Viasat has these antennas, which are capable of doing that uh, and are able to connect the satellites and connect to the internet in that way uh, to provide a much, much stronger signal. Um, and that's what uh, the like Delta and United planes that I mentioned before have. Um, and like a home Wi-Fi system, uh, those systems have a modem and router inside the plane that converts it to be used by like phones and laptops in the same way that a home Wi-Fi would be. How large is this satellite? Where is it located in, in the plane or on the plane? Uh, so the, the actual receiver uh, is on the exterior oh, the of the plane right. yep. okay. in, in, in a radome. So uh, you, you won't really notice it. It would be just like a, a bump on the outside. Um, mm. and, and so anytime you have a system like that, um, a system exterior to the plane, you have to do all the exterior of the plane testings, like the, uh, the frozen chicken test. It's if the you, frozen chicken test. Yeah. So when when you're in danger of having a bird strike on a oh, yeah, aircraft, yeah, yeah. I've heard of this. <laughs> you, you have to basically cannon frozen chickens at whatever you're going to put on the outside of the plane <laughs> to make sure it doesn't break. Um, so the systems are designed to meet those types of requirements as well as the other safety requirements. Well, that's now my new favorite safety. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess just like comparatively, you said like using a cell tower would be so much slower. Um, I assume that satellite is faster in general just because of like how direct things can be. But of course, it's harder to get it out to the entire populace. So I guess my question is, how much faster would a uh, satellite connection be compared to a cell tower would be for like a plane, for example? So there's three main considerations. Uh, the bandwidth, which is just how much signal can you send along the system? Um, and from what I understand, it, it's relatively comparable and depends on where you're at. Mm -hmm. um, there's the distance affects it significantly. I mean, all these things are electromagnetic signals, which means they all move at the speed of light. Um, so if you just take that distance, uh, satellites do have a farther distance to go. But specifically for the airline applications, signal strength plays a huge impact. So if you're sending a signal that's 100 bits and you're sending it on a mobile tower, again, based on my understanding, uh, you'll be actually receiving a lot less of that information uh, from a mobile tower than you would from a satellite connection. The satellite connection is much more stable mm -hmm. and, and has much better uh, capability to provide service in that way. And that's why um, some, some companies that use these new satellite antennas um, use to pay what, like $10, $20 like per hour for internet access on an airplane because they had to limit the number of people using it. But some, some of these companies on their newer flights are saying free Wi-Fi, everyone go ahead because there's that signal strength and that bandwidth to provide that. Interesting. So one thing I'm still confused about is, I guess, the, the receiver and how it manages to, I guess, interact with the satellite when this plane is moving like hundreds of miles per hour. Can, without going into any proprietary technology, can you just shed more light into this or explain the concept in maybe a little bit more detail? Yeah. So um, you, you have to take a little bit of the directionality out of the equation because mm -hmm. um, I mean, like I said, it's a challenging problem, but it's not an unsolvable one. Um, so like I, I mentioned before, you have the dish and the feed horn. What happens if you get rid of the dish, make a really big feed horn? Mm -hmm. It's effectively the same concept, uh, just a little bit more expensive. Um, and so as my understanding, that's what's used. Uh, it's, it's a larger receiver, uh, which allows it to carry more signal. Um, but the material considerations for that mm -hmm. are pretty similar to what would be used on the ground. You're just looking for materials that can, uh, I guess, absorb that signal very effectively. So going into that then, um, you mentioned that, you know, material properties differ in space um, versus on land and then also like sea and in air. Have there been any, I guess, from like Let's talk about the, the metals perspective. Um, how do those properties differ in those different environments? That's a good question. Um, so 
at, at sea, your biggest problem is the saline water. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, it, 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 that, that corrosion impacts the majority of your decisions um, when it comes to material selection. So it, it needs to match its function. And then it's all about how much salt water can it withstand for how much time. Because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, there, there are lots of materials that just won't withstand that. Um, then when you're looking at things on the ground and in space, or on the ground and in land, are not all that dissimilar. I mean, it's lower atmosphere up on like a plane, but the parts are internal to the spacecraft for the most part. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're in the pressurized cabin. It's, it's not that different of an environment. Um, but space, you start to get into really interesting considerations um, because of the longevity you need to meet and because of the vacuum of space, materials behave very differently. And they have no, no gravity to prevent certain issues that can occur and no atmosphere to prevent certain issues that can occur. Like, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the process of cold welding, but so welding is when you connect two pieces of metal. Like if you take two pieces of steel and you get really hot other pieces of steel or wire or whatever it is, and, uh, basically melt a line together. But in space, if you have two clean pieces of steel and touch them, no heat needed. You have new one piece of steel. Um, really? And that works what? for <laughs> any metals. Yeah. It's because what you're doing with the heat is melting it down to remove the oxide layer on the outside. Uh -huh. um, you might notice it on like a, aluminum. It has a white oxide that forms. Mm -hmm. But in space, that doesn't form in space. Um, there, there's no oxygen to form it. Right. <laughs> wow. Cold <So>, welding <laughs> changes the space manufacturing game. I feel like <laughs> it does. Everything needs to either already be welded in the way you want it, never move, or it needs to be coated in a way or protected in a way such that you're not locking your equipment into a, a situation you don't want it to be in. Wow. That is, I've never heard of cold welding before. That is crazy. So I guess the follow-up question is, how does Viasat make sure like nothing moves like when it gets in space? Is there any like materials that we can like use to cover it? Like even if we send it up with an oxide, does it immediately get ripped off in the vacuum of space? Or what are some of the solutions to these problems that you just talked about? Yeah, so a natural oxide layer is going to be microns thin, uh, just the, the very surface layers. Um, so a lot of times what's done is a chemical protective coating uh, or, or even things like a paint will be applied. Um, uh, so you can, uh, there are certain chemical coatings that will convert like the, the top several atoms of, of the equipment, um, either embedding new uh, resistive atoms in there, or there are some that will just lay a thin coating of some type of resistive compound over that. Um, or even something like a paint, which would be visibly applied over the whole surface. Um, so it, you really want that mechanical separation. That's interesting. So it is kind of similar to aircrafts and how they, they use like paint or like chemicals for like to prevent um, corrosion as quick or like quicker corrosion. So it seems like there's similarities there. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. If, if you want to stop your metal from doing something you don't want it to do, just paint something on it and it stops. <laughs> uh, that, that's a very common solution to those types of problems. Cool. Cool. And so Viasat has also announced plans for the Viasat 3 constellation, which you told us is a satellite configuration to provide internet globally. And so mm -hmm. we were just wondering, could you first walk us through the material science considerations in satellites? And then maybe we can talk more in detail about the Viasat mm -hmm. 3 constellation. Yeah. So, I mean, cold welding is not in the grand scheme of things that big of a deal. Uh, the biggest consideration is when you're putting a satellite up, where are you putting it? So uh, there are generally regarded as three levels of orbit. There's geosynchronous orbit, which is where Viasat satellites, the Viasat 3 constellation will be. And that's uh, generally the highest orbit used for communication satellites. 
So geosynchronous satellites are going to be around the equator and wherever they're at relative to the surface of the earth, they're going to stay. Mm -hmm. So if you put it over your house right now, it's supposed to stay directly over your house all the time. There's uh, the middle orbit. Uh, geosynchronous is referred to as geo. Uh, mm -hmm. Middle orbit is referred to as meo, which is just a space kind of in between. And there's low Earth orbit, leo, mm -hmm. um, which are uh, much, much closer to the Earth. And uh, they move relative to the Earth. So if you want to provide a stable connection, you have to put a lot more satellites in orbit uh, to be able to constantly connect to the same points on the ground. Um, so that is the biggest consideration mm -hmm. because it determines how many satellites you need to launch to meet mm -hmm. the same goal and how long you want those satellites to last. Mm -hmm. So the Viasat-3 satellites are supposed to be three satellites all across the world, uh, one over North America, one mm -hmm. other over Europe and Africa, and one over Asia so that it can provide full internet for everywhere but the North and South Pole, um, which don't need it that bad. <laughs> <laughs> the penguins might need it, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so when you're doing satellites like that, I mean, you're only gonna put up three. They are ultra high capacity satellites. So each mm -hmm. one is rated at a terabit per second, which is huge in satellite terms. Um, because of just the amount of area and number of connections they're gonna support. Mm -hmm. um, these satellites need to last for absolutely as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And so you have to look at every concern. There's a concern about satellites with off-gassing. So mm -hmm. you wouldn't notice it on the ground where we have an atmosphere, but a lot of the materials around us will give off uh, gas. Like if you've ever noticed wood has a smell or some plastics mm -hmm. will have a smell. That's them constantly releasing gas over time. If you have a satellite, those gases could propel it out of an alignment, could change the dimensions of certain pieces um, as they're released. Uh, if you have optics on the satellite, those things could cloud your optics. Like imagine if you had a telescope and a year into the telescope being up in space, uh, the mirror is clouded and it just doesn't reflect anymore. That's terrible for you. So uh, the off-gassing is a, a major, major concern. And the last concern that, that I deal with is the concern around the use of tin. The, the metal tin is used in a lot of electronics um, and it has a, a process that it goes through where uh, microscopic whiskers of tin can just flake off and float around. And uh, when you have a place that has no resistance to those floating around, there's no air or gravity to, to bring those down, mm -hmm. it can cause short circuits on your electronic components and disable your satellite at any time. So you need to make sure you meet those uh, needs effectively. That was, that's crazy. So I, there's so much to unpack. So I guess we'll just start at the beginning. But so the first one is just, when we talk about the geosynchronous orbit level, uh, like what is like the relative scale compared to like um, airplanes? Like we know airplanes fly like 35,000 feet. Um, what are like kind of the levels compared to that? Um, so, I mean, airplanes are still in the atmosphere significantly and mm -hmm. you have multiple levels of atmosphere like uh, up through like the mesosphere and the ionosphere. Um, but these are well, well into the exosphere, which is just open space. Um, so, uh, like an airline will fly at 30,000 feet, which is I'm trying to do the conversion in my head, what, 10 kilometers, maybe, I think so. Yeah, about that. <laughs> yeah. So to maintain a circular geosynchronous orbit. I, I did just look it up while I was talking just to make sure it's about 36,000 kilometers. Oh, wow. I also Googled it and that, that yeah. does look right. <laughs> wow. So yeah, cause yes. I know I've never seen a satellite while I'm in the airplane, but I was just wondering like how much farther <laughs> above my head it was. Yeah. So. I mean, and, and they're not meant to be visible. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're, they're way, way out there. Now, if you look at some of the Leo satellites, 
those uh, are close enough to the earth that if they're reflective enough, um, so like the, the light on the moon is reflected from the sun. Mm -hmm. So the satellites can do the same thing. If, if it's night in one place and the satellites in Leo orbit are reflective enough, they can be reflecting sunlight enough to be visible to the na naked eye or to a telescope. And then can we talk about the, the tin for a moment? So what exactly about it? And it's like the microscopic whiskers can really like hurt the whole system at, uh, in general. I mean, basically, uh, it, it's not about losing the connection or losing the tin. It's about what can that whisker go to? Cause that, that whisker is essentially a wire. I mean, it's a, a connected piece of metal that's very long and very thin. So if it settles in the wrong place or touches the wrong place and then touches another place, oh. it can create a short circuit that can fry any number of components or um, get, I mean, they're, they're microscopic. So mechanically, they don't cause that much cause for concern, but it can impact electronics significantly. Especially, I mean, when you look at a circuit board nowadays, so many of those components are just the smallest things you could ever see. I mean, when you, if you think about one of those potentially making its way into like a processor or something like that, uh, processors have microscopic transistors. So it could connect very, very easily in, in something like that situation. So you, you need to be you need to be aware of that possibility so that you can prevent it as much as possible. And so what steps do you do to, to prevent it? Do you just try to limit the use of tin um, to like reduce the chance or like, is there any more like technology on board that can like try to attract it away from the electronic pieces? Yeah. Um, so you can limit the use of tin and that's a, a big good step. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and you can also apply, um, it seems very similar to the, the solution for other metals. You apply a coating over the entire board <laughs> and that provides a mechanical barrier from okay. the, the whiskers escaping, which is the, the most common. It's called a conformal coat. Cool. So I wanted to move on to a different application that you had mentioned like right before this call and it was about getting connection to emergency response teams and to first responders and I honestly don't know really where to start so I was just wondering can you explain the need for this application and the materials that come into play here yeah so you have the opportunity to be very humanitarian when you can provide internet to anywhere um, I mean if you think this podcast is going to be on the internet. The internet is a resource for information and is not available in a whole lot of places, but with satellite systems, it can be available anywhere. Um, so Viasat has systems that can work with first responders or with communities that aren't serviced um, by traditional service providers um, to provide internet connectivity. So, I mean, that may not seem like a big deal if you're fighting a wildfire in California where you'll be able to get mobile signal anywhere. But if you're fighting a wildfire in the Amazon rainforest, there's not going to be a cell tower 10 feet down the road uh, to provide you that connection. So if you're trying to coordinate efforts, um, you, those satellite connections can be critical. And then um, on the, the community side, Viasat provides connection points um, for like small communities that aren't serviced by, by any other providers where the community can gather around that point, do things like charge their phones. Cause a lot of them have phones. Um, they charge their phones and are able to connect, uh, look things up and connect with the outside world in a way that they're not able to without these systems. And so I guess taking a step back, when we talk about like the bias at three, you're saying it's going to provide uh, it, it could provide internet for all the entire world. So when we talk about like these small little uh, people that are out in the wilderness versus like the city, how, when we talked about the dish before, it sounded like you could only shoot it up in like certain areas almost. So how can three satellites be able to basically broadcast across an entire continent um, as it's almost like uh, the dish? Yeah, so... Um... I don't know how much of that I could get into. 
okay. simply because I, I, I mean, I, I'm a material science engineer, not yeah. uh, an RF engineer. I, I don't mm-hmm. design that portion of the satellites, but from what I understand, it, it operates on a similar concept. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, uh, again, I don't know that much about actual signal processing, mm-hmm. but when you think about it, like I- anywhere now, you can tune into radio signal. You don't have to be requesting that information. Mm -hmm. So I think it's up to the Viasat systems on the ground to interpret what information they asked for. Mm -hmm. And like, if if you think about it, like for example, my neighborhood has one internet line that comes into the neighborhood and then that's split among all the houses. But if I pull up Netflix, they don't all get the same Netflix. Like, Mm -hmm. um, so it's about what, your system knowing what information you requested and how to pull that out of the signal. So this might be a little bit of a dumb question, but do the, for that Viasat 3 constellation, does that require the construction of more ground systems or no? It absolutely does. Okay. Um, yeah. So because you need to be able to, I mean, so on the one hand, you need to be able to provide the connection to the internet, to the satellite. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's critical. Um, if you don't connect the internet to the satellite, nothing you can do. And that's where the really large antennas come in. Um, but the smaller consumer side antennas are also needed. Uh, and the same, it'll be the same ones that are used for like, um, the ones that are used on airlines now will be able to connect to Viasat 3. The antenna that are used on boats are able to connect to Viasat 3 when it comes online. Um, and the Viasat 3 constellation is already in preparation. The first one is scheduled to be launched in 2022 with the rest following up shortly after. So the, the North America one should be in orbit and functioning in a year's time. Well, I guess we've talked about a lot of cool technology, especially around like satellites and antennas. Uh, and you kind of mentioned this earlier is that there's not really any regulation around what we do send up in space. So I guess, is there any plan for Viasat or any company to get debris down or what does the end of a life of a satellite kind of look like? Yeah, so that is a great question. And it's a question a lot of people have and many people do not have answers for. And many people that probably should have an answer mm-hmm. don't answer it. Um, so as to what happens to the satellites, that depends on where they're at. So there's a huge separation between like geosynchronous and low earth orbit um, because like the geosynchronous if you were to try and bring that back it takes so much effort coordination money to go grab that satellite out of that high orbit and bring it down Um, so generally those are sent into a deeper orbit Um, so the satellites all have propellants uh, that can be used to maneuver them in cases of like near collisions or things like that Um, because there's, there are a lot of objects in space. So you, you need to be able to maneuver your satellites. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they'll use often the last of their propellant to be propelled into a deeper orbit. Mm -hmm. Um, and then traditionally Leo satellites are very, very close to the atmosphere. Um, and so they're deorbited with their propellant and they burn up in the atmosphere. So how many satellites are just like they, they serve their purpose already um, and they're like defunct now. How many are there currently in orbit versus like the total number of satellites? Do you know? So I was actually interested in this earlier this week. Um, so the first satellite, Sputnik 1, was launched in 1957, I think. Um, since then, there have been about 10,000 satellites launched, which tells you we've really ramped up the production in those 64 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and there's, from what I understand, about 3,000 of those are, are non-functional and about half of the remaining are inactive, which means they're just not being used, but they could still work. Um, uh, but there are plans. I mean, if you look at s- some other companies' plans to put like 30 or 45,000 satellites into orbit, um, which is orders of magnitude greater than what's in orbit now. Uh, The the systems to make sure that those are safe and don't don't end up in disaster Mm -hmm. need to be put into place in advance. Um, I was thinking about it uh, last week, actually. 
like from a material standpoint, there's a lot you can do there. If you're trying to put 30,000 satellites in low earth orbit, mm -hmm. uh, obviously you're going to plan for there never being a collision. A collision of two satellites is a nightmare, not just for those two satellites, but because it would spray debris across that orbit. Mm -hmm. And when you look at things that are in orbit, they're moving at thousands of kilometers per hour, but they're not all moving in the same direction. So imagine you couldn't have a head-on collision at 14,000 kilometers per hour with even a speck of paint and come away from that doing fine. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about it. If, if you were able to, from a material standpoint, build something like a shatterproof satellite. Um, so you hope it doesn't collide, but if it does, you're protected against that type of eventuality. Mm -hmm. um, like uh, you could think of it in the same way as like a, a car windshield. If you're in a car, you hope you don't get into a head-on collision. I mean, uh, obviously everyone would hope that, but <laughs> if you were to get into a head-on collision, would you rather have a shatterproof windshield so it's not going to spray your face with glass? And it, you can put in systems like that uh, to prevent an accident from being a catastrophe. But then I guess like it's two different stories, right? For a car going, let's say like 60, 100 kilometers per hour versus a satellite going 14,000 kilometers per hour, what materials could potentially be used to make something of that magnitude shatterproof? Yeah, that is an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, there's so many variables to be considered. And mm. I don't know that there's a place on earth you could test it. Um, but I, I personally think that's a better solution than cleaning up debris. Um, mm -hmm. cause like there, there are systems and, and Viasat works with some companies that work on these systems that are meant to go up, grab a piece of debris, come back down and deorbit. Um, and those are good but maybe not as effective as preventing um, worse damage. Because if you have that damage occur and two things collide and send a spray of debris, that is going to cause a cascade of future collisions. Because if two satellites collide, mm -hmm. even if you prevent it, say it doesn't break into a million pieces, it breaks into 10,000 pieces. Uh, that's a lot better. <laughs> um, so. It, being able to, to just limit it at all, maybe instead of using glass, you use plexiglass. Uh, I mean, it, those, those specific types of concerns haven't been addressed by anyone that I'm aware of um, because people say, I mean, we, we can prevent the collisions. That's just simply not always going to be true forever. Mm -hmm. Especially, Especially if we start... Yeah, 35,000 satellites out there. <laughs> that's, that's one company. And that plan exists now, but internet usage goes up 30% every year. Mm -hmm. So if you want to keep up with demand, you either have to increase the capacity of your satellites by 30% every year, which mm -hmm. they're in orbit. You can't change that. <laughs> or um, you need to keep launching more. 30% yeah. more every year scales up really big, really fast. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Uh, so especially when we talk about like emerging countries in like uh, Africa and Asia who haven't traditionally had internet access and are starting to ramp up, mm -hmm. uh, we could easily see the internet usage climb even higher than 30%, especially as we kind of all transition to such a digital world. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and I mean, sometimes satellite internet is not going to be the right way to go. I mean, I, I live in the city of Atlanta. If everyone were connected to satellite internet in the city of Atlanta, it would take more than every satellite in orbit. Um, so it, it's not, it's not meant for that. It's, it's meant to be, where is it necessary? Where do the other like cable-based services, where are they not able to effectively provide that signal? Um, and that's where places, or that's where Viasat systems and, and other satellite systems in general shine. Uh, it's, it's where can you not put a cable down to get there? 
Gotcha. So this might be a related question, but there has been a recent shift to creating reusable systems such as SpaceX's uh, Falcon 9. And so are we seeing potentially the same trend with other systems throughout the industry? Could that be possible with these satellite systems? So it, it definitely is. Um, I don't think so with the satellites themselves. Mm. Uh, generally, I mean, e even with humans, uh, exposure to space uh, has a lasting impact yeah. and you don't generally see things get brought down and then reused that commonly. Um, uh, es especially not satellites because they don't have a landing mechanism so, <laughs> or, or heat shielding. Um, yeah. So they, they do not survive the atmosphere. Um, uh, the ground systems, though, are seeing a, a lot of reusability and a, a lot of interesting um, uses. So there's been a big trend in a lot of markets to use whatever commodities you have as a service. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you think about it like Uber, Uber is using your car and you as the driver as a service mm -hmm. to share that same car, that same transportation with other people. Uh, you can do the same with satellite ground systems. And uh, Viasat does that because a lot of companies and organizations have satellites in orbit, but sometimes your satellite doesn't need the ground systems uh, specifically for it, or you don't have the money to invest to pay uh, to have ground systems all across the globe for it. Mm -hmm. And Viasat has... Uh, a program called Real Time Earth, um, which is a network of those ground systems uh, for use by companies and other entities uh, to use those ground systems as a service. Because um, I mean, they're they're expensive to put in place, uh, but it removes a huge cost barrier, and the company or organization still has to get their satellite in orbit, but they don't have to also face the same cost of developing the worldwide network at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then um, for reusability, uh, I did want to address, th there are cases where maybe the actual parts are not reused, but the reusability of a design is critical. Um, and that's, that's where satellites uh, do see a lot of the, their reusability. So like all three Viasat-3 satellites are, are the same. They're picture perfect copies of each other. I mean, they, they don't all exist at the same time yet because uh, they're in a stage production a few months apart, but um, they operate on the same exact design and many satellite systems to operate as a constellation like the, the LEO satellites, for example. I mean, there are hundreds of those mm -hmm. all using the same design, just copy paste, copy paste, um, which does limit a lot of the cost uh, mm -hmm because it's, it's very expensive to design a satellite, but if you can design one satellite and make three or 10 or a hundred of them, you are spreading that design cost out a lot. So I guess when we talk about like design similarities, um, would do you like, is like a satellite, when we talk about improvements within satellites, is like you versus your competitor, is it like an iPhone where like the designs are updated every year? and you like continue to try to one-up each other? Or is it kind of just like pretty standard across industry in that respect uh, for each individual like grouping of satellites for each different orbit? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So mm -hmm. there are so many applications for satellite technology. I mean, there is communication and that, that sees a lot of media focus now, mm -hmm. but there's so many other applications and there's so many different categories of satellite. I mean, when you think about it, if you put a pebble in space, that is a satellite, um, as long as it's <laughs> orbiting the Earth. Um, Not a very good one. But sure. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't have a lot of uses, but it is one. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a huge variety in the size of satellites, and those different size categories tend to see a lot of the same things. Uh, just uh, off my head, there's uh, like cube satellites are, are relatively small. They would like uh, uh, the size that Amazon would ship, I guess, um, like a, a relatively big box. Um, there's 
micro satellites, which might be like a single scientific instrument and the antenna to connect it to the ground. Mm -hmm. um, just simply for monitoring something in space. Uh, and then there's bigger satellites, like for, uh, for example, like Viasat satellites are, are relatively big, like uh, trailer sized. Um, maybe depending on the trailer, but uh, trailer sized. <laughs> um, and then there's, I mean, if you think about really big satellites, the International Space Station is a satellite and it's mm -hmm. huge. I mean, it houses people, uh, multiple people for months at a time. So th there are a lot of different categories and they tend to be reminiscent of each other within the same category. Mm, okay. So I guess that's where companies can differ is like their applications and then their manufacturing, they can really niche down and find, you know, their the most efficient process for that. So with Viasat, is it the same manufacturing process or is it different lines for slightly different applications? Well, all of Viasats are communication. All of Viasats proprietary mm -hmm. satellites are, are communication satellites. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there, there aren't that many. Uh, I, th I think there, there's only a handful um, that cover different areas of North America, um, Brazil, uh, Europe, and Australia. And a lot of those are, are partnered with other companies that actually own them. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, like the Viasat 3 satellites are all uh, made by Viasat for Viasat. Um, and they all operate on the same design. But uh, I mean, in, in general, a satellite has a lot of specific needs and every satellite has the same needs you got to have a solar panel because you got to get power. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to have some kind of antenna and then it's whatever function you want. And then uh, uh, the propellant system to be able to maneuver it. Oh, well, that's super cool. And we've discussed a variety of topics today surrounding materials in the information industry. And you made it very clear that we're only going to see more and more satellites and all these other ground fixtures um, in the future. So uh, since you've had experience in this field and in this industry, we just like to ask, what advice do you have for material scientists or even uh, people who aren't in material science that do want to get into this industry? Yeah, so I, I would say the most critical thing, and this is said all the time, but uh, I really do take it to heart, is you have to be able to learn constantly. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you get to a point where you need to know so much different stuff. And like, I came from an environmental engineering background, like you said, um, which that is very different. Uh, it, it's very useful in a lot of the same ways, but it is very different. Um, but I was able to learn a lot of, lot of what I needed quickly. Um, and, and my experience in school uh, taught me to learn things extremely quickly and in an ongoing fashion. Um, like if you encounter something you don't know, don't let it stay that way. Um, like if you see a news article that you're interested in the headline, don't go tell your friends, oh, I saw this headline. Tell them about what you read in the article. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a lot of people don't do that. They're, they're okay with surface level information, um, but it, it's nice to not be just surface level information, being able to, to learn more is such a useful skill. For sure. And if you can, if you have the opportunity asking questions to people who know more than you as well, seems to fall into that same category. I know you're the lead material science engineer, so you often have to find the answers yourselves, but I just wanted to add that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, still, I, I face situations all the time at, and this is not even specifically for material science stuff, for mm -hmm. things that deal with regulations, other questions I have at Viasat. Um, I mean, you, you have to remove the fear of, of asking a question. Uh, mm -hmm. So regardless of what they're going to answer, you still need to know it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and that's really important. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I, I definitely think the best answer you can get a lot of times, I mean, not when it's critical, is an I don't know from them. Because mm -hmm. then you both get to learn it together. And mm -hmm. when when you 
are doing that and digging and thinking, it mm -hmm. stays with you for so much longer than just someone telling it to you. Yeah. And one of my favorite teachers routinely said, I don't know, and then would come back with three literature sources the next class and tell you exactly the answer you're looking for. So just like the uh, humility to go and like search and tell the person they don't know, I think is really important. And especially when you were talking about like the headlines, I know, uh, especially with today's media, a lot of like the onion gets people on just reading the headline. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and they wouldn't be around unless people did it. So I just think it's uh, just more life advice more than just yeah. how to get into satellites. So I'm, thank you. I mean, honestly, I'm going to have my wife listen to this segment of the podcast because I can't tell you the number of headlines she tells me and has no idea what's in the article. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, when I talk about it, I think back to, there was a day I, I was in eighth grade in math and I asked my math teacher what zero over zero was. And he was like, oh, it's undefined. I'm like, I don't think it is. And we sat there in class and looked it up. And, and I remember that day more clearly than I remember any part of middle school <laughs> uh, <laughs> because like it, it stuck with me as a time where I asked someone, they didn't know, and we both learned about it together. Mm -hmm. And th that's a, a great moment. For sure. Yeah, when you can really dive into the why and like how things work and you get to do that all yourself, then that's really what resonates. So I totally agree with that sentiment. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, thank you so much, Jordan, for jumping on the show with us today. We really learned a lot. I didn't even know um, the impact of materials in such a specific application like uh, satellite communication. So really learned a lot today. Yeah. Everything's made out of materials. So it's, it's not going away. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thanks guys. It's been an absolute ton of fun. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the It's a Material World podcast. If you enjoyed the show, consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. And if you'd like to support us on this journey or simply show off your love for MSC, we actually released merchandise. And if you'd like to check out more of the designs, visit itsamaterialworldpodcast.com slash shop or use the link in the description. We'll see you soon. And in the meantime, go change the world.